America, and uh, he's uh, in his 70s and she's 70. And uh, he said, I don't know what I could, whether I could live a day without her or not. I just don't know whether I could. He said, she looks in the mirror and she thinks she's ugly because she's older now. And he said, she doesn't look like she did when she was young, but I look at her and I see her ways. I, 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 her voice is like music to me. It just, if she died, he said, I don't know what I'd do. He said, I, in the shape that I'm in and everything else, he said, I just don't know what I'd do. And I said, you know, I said, the Lord, God gives us a certain amount of time in this world. And a mate is a wonderful thing. You ought to look at each other like that. And he said, well, she, I can't get over it. She thinks she's so ugly. And he said, I look at her and she's so beautiful. Well, I tell my wife how beautiful she is and she tells me how ugly she is. I think all, most women do that. They, they look at themselves. That is if they're not 18 years old. When they're 18 years old, of course, they know that they're in the prime of their life and everything else. But when they get 40 and 50 and 60 and 70, then things start changing. And they see themselves as an old woman. And you still, their husbands still look at them and see a beautiful woman. They see the woman that they married. They see beauty, the smile and their voices and everything. Well, <coughs> beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. The third chapter of the book of Ephesians tells us in many ways how God looks at his bride. And I, I will repeat this again. I, I, I do not believe that the Bible teaches a, a universal church. I believe the Bible speaks only of visible local assemblies. And of those visible, visible local assemblies, that's where we serve God. That's where we... we uh, that's where we work for the Lord, is in those churches. The, uh, the church as an institute is, is as we, we can look and we can speak of, the church as an institute. But the family of God is a whole different story. The family of God are all the same. All the same. The saved are in the family of God. Now churches are where people enter into a specific place of service and a closeness with God that many people in the family of God never do. They just never never reach that. Now, <clears throat> in heaven, and we're about to get into the seven churches of Asia, of Asia in the book of Revelation. We're going to go through that quickly. God looks at his churches down through the ages. He says the things he likes about them. He says the things that they were doing wrong in all those ages. He's talking about churches. There were saved people during all those times that many of them never were in any churches at all. The Lord is going to uh, call his bride up and all the saved on these days of the rapture. His bride is going to be very close to him. Now, salvation is of grace only, isn't it? We know that. Salvation is by grace only. But in churches, and every time you find, and you're going to see it here, and you're going to see it in the book of Revelation, what does the book of Revelation say? Her bride was, a, the Lord's bride was adorned in white linen. For well, the bride has what? Made herself ready. She has prepared herself for the Lord. That's the middle voice, people. Now, salvation is of God, but service is you and God working together. And you allowing your anatomy to be used by God in a specific place and service. As simple as that. And you'll see always that salvation is something that is done by God. But what is the sign of the covenant in the New Testament time? The New Covenant. What is the sign of the covenant? What's the sign of the covenant? The old, the old covenant, the sign of the covenant, the law of Moses, the sign of that covenant was what? The ark. No, not the sign. The, no, no. the, the ark was what? The rainbow. Uh, well, no, that was Noah's day. That was, that was, that was, that was God's covenant with mankind. Was it the cloud? No. no. Oh, that's not the sign. What the was the sign? What? The seven? No. What was the sign of the covenant 
the Abrahamic covenant. Ten Commandments? No. Circumcision. Circumcision. Who said circumcision? Brother Eric. Thank you, brother. Circumcision. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. Now, I want you tell, to tell you something. I want to remind you of this. <clears throat> when Abraham was called by God out of the earth of the Chaldees, he came in. He had one son. God promised him a son. He promised him a son. And they just didn't think that Sarah was going to be the mother. So he married Hagar. And he had a son. And that son's name was what? Ishmael. Ishmael. All right. Ishmael. Now, Abraham hadn't signed the covenant yet, had he? God did. That was the unconditional part of it. The unconditional part of that covenant was signed. That's when they took the, the, the lambs and the birds and all the stuff and split them up. And God walked between Abraham and had nothing to do with that. That's a type of salvation. <coughs> But this covenant <clears throat> that would come down and they would go into the land and be blessed. Abraham, when he signed the covenant, he was circumcised, wasn't he? Sarah never had that child, that promised child, until Abraham was circumcised. After he was circumcised, she conceived and she brought forth the child. All right? He signed the covenant. All right? What is the sign of the New Testament covenant? What is that New Testament covenant? How do you get a New Testament, New Covenant relationship with God? We're not talking about salvation. The New Covenant is given to the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you sign that covenant? Circumcision of the heart. What? Circumcision of the heart. Baptism. No, that's salvation. Baptism. Huh? Baptism. Baptism. All right. You die to your own self, you die whatever, and you are giving yourself to God in service. And you are lining up with the New Testament church to do it. That's what you're doing. This is that church relationship that we're talking of here in the book of Ephesians. It's different. <clears throat> Only Baptists taught this for the last 2,000 years. I'm telling you, the rest of the world, the religious Protestant world does not know this subject whatsoever. They don't have any idea. As great a man as J. Vernon McGee was, and he was a great preacher, he never knew what the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ were in all reality. He got the church confused with the family of God. He did. He did not see that special relationship. And it is different. It's different. It's night and day, but it is faulty to the world because they don't know anything about it. Or what were the rest of the religious world wouldn't surrender to it if they did see it. But where do you learn about it? In New Testament churches. That's where you learn about it. All right, let's look at this now. The last time I thought this was 1027, 1976. That was a long time ago. How long ago was that? Four years after I graduated. <laughs> 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 that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Emoy. Toll. Elakisto Tero. Elakisto Tero. Ponton. Ponton. Hagion. Hagion. Edothe. Edothe. Hey. Hey. Caris. Caris. Haute. Haute. Tois. Tois. Eth Nissen. Eth Nissen. Yuangalis Saste. Yuangalis Saste. To. To. Anex E. Ne Aston. Anex E. Pluto. 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 To. To. Christo. Christo. All right. This is a quite a verse. Paul was very familiar with all of the riches of the <coughs> ancient world. You have to realize the Roman Empire, they had... To they had many of the seven wonders of the ancient world were still standing. Many of these, uh, you, you have to realize also that down in Egypt, the pyramids, how many of you have seen the pyramids of Egypt? Well, they don't look anything today like they did originally. They were one of the wonders of the world. 
You know that each one of those pyramids was covered with alabaster stone and polished like glass? Did you know? They shone like mirrors when people would see them. Was this, these were wonders of the world. Paul had seen some of the great riches of the world. There were places in the Roman Empire, there were those temples and things that, that had not been destroyed yet by other uh, peoples. Great riches. But Paul's going to start talking about the riches of God. God has riches that we can't even understand. You know what the, the millennial reign is? Of Christ. You know that we are going to be in kindergarten, we're going to be in preschool there, preparing us for eternity in heaven with God. <laughs> Just think about it for a little while. What's God going to be doing? The Lord is going to be teaching us. What we learn here is nothing. We have no idea. How many of you have ever seen heaven? We talk about it, don't we? That's about it. We talk about it. We can compare some of the beauties of this world. Uh, beautiful statues, beautiful cities, beautiful mountains with trees, and beautiful green valleys and rivers, snow-capped mountains. These things are things of beauty. Some things God made and some things man made. You go out on the ocean. I, the ocean is the most beautiful thing. Just get out there where you don't see anything but ocean. That's beautiful. You get, I don't care if you throw a fishing line down there, and I don't care what happens, so you're going to bring up something you've never seen before. Beauty. Some of the things that God has just placed all over this world to flabbergast us. Well, just think of bugs for a little while. Look at all the bugs. Look how God has created all the, uh, the things that we can see. The birds. How many of you just sat out in your yard and listened to the birds this last week? Get out there early morning and talk, listen to them talking. They'll talk to you if you let them. You just don't understand. They're trying to talk. <laughs> I go out in my backyard and talk to my pig. She talks. She communicates. My dogs do. My chickens do. All the horses, all, they all communicate. Cats. You know, in that millennial reign, the, all the animal kingdom is going to communicate again with mankind. Just like it did in the garden. If we're going to get to see what the garden of Eden is like. The world is going to grow. The world is going to populate like you cannot believe. And we're going to be taught of the Lord directly. Paul says to me, Emoi, <coughs> the least, elas kist totero, the least. This is a double comparative. Most least is what he says here. I am the most least of all, pomtone, the hagion. What is a hagion? Hagios is where it comes from. That comes from alpha and gay, which means not of the serve. When you're born the first time, you're born of the world. When you're born the second time, you're born from above. Okay? Born not of the earth. He said, I'm the least of all the saints. The least. Why did he think he was the least? Paul was the apostle. The Lord picked him out. Apostle. Apostle means apo. It comes from apo and cello. It means one sent out with authority. That's the gift that was placed in what? Where, was the, where were the apostles placed? What gift? It was a gift placed in what? In the church. A gift placed in the church. All right? Now why? Several of the apostles wrote books of the New Testament, didn't they? Who were the books given to? The church. The churches. Who were the books written to? The churches. <laughs> all the New Testament le letters, except for the, the book of uh, Hebrews, basically, were all written to New Testament churches. We have one right here that was a circular letter to all the churches. It wasn't an Ephesian letter. It's a letter to all the churches, including us today. All right? <clears throat> the least of all the saints, it was given. All right? Third person singular, first verse, indicative, passive. 
it was given to him. It comes from didomi, that word does. Until your action, it was given to me the grace, this gift, this unmerited mercy. Once you've been saved, once you have surrendered to the call of God to serve Him in a church someplace, it is a gift that God gave you to serve Him. You know what God's doing? He's working through you. He is living through you. Jesus Christ lived on this earth one time, 33 and a half years. But you know how many people He has lived through since then? Every person in a New Testament church that has ever served Him, has, He has lived through them, and He has glorified Himself. What do you do when you preach God's Word, when you teach God's Word, when you live God's Word? What do you do when you live the kind of life in your neighborhood that people say, I'd like to be a Christian like her? Without ever hearing anything else. I'd like to be a Christian like her. I'd like to be a father like him. I'd like to be a mother like her. You're living out the life of Christ again. The grace. Then he says, Hate, and this to the nations, to the Gentiles. Now you have to realize that Paul was a Gentile hater at one time, wasn't he? What do you think about Gentiles? They were dogs. They were dogs. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the elect of the Pharisees. He was a, there was a select group of Pharisees that thought they were better than all the other Pharisees, and Paul was one of them. Paul was a, he was a, a member of the Sanhedrin court. He was an uh, uh, a, a absolute example to the community as a father and a husband and everything else. He, he was uh, the, the cream of the crop. And he was prejudiced to the nth degree. And when Gentiles came, they had to denounce who they were. Now Paul has told us that God has made all men equal. There is no such thing as a Jew and a Gentile anymore. We are all unclean before God. And we all need to be circumcised apart, which is salvation. Circumcised, it says, without hands. Circumcised without hands. And he said, it was given to me this grace to the nations to preach, to evangelize. First Harris indicative, middle voice. I can't tell you what a desire I have to preach God's word. I can't explain it to you. I'd be preaching to my pig out in the backyard if I wasn't preaching to some class someplace. Or somebody in some restaurant or some coffee shop or somebody or some Indian out there in the middle of nowhere or something. I'd be preaching to somebody. I'd be teaching over the radio. I'd be preaching something. Because as Jeremiah said, he said it was like a fire in my bones. When God calls you to do something, he gives you a desire to do it. And it comes from within. Because God's Spirit and your Spirit you get going the right direction. I can't explain that to you except it comes from inside and it comes from outside. And it makes you want to preach, want to teach God's Word. Paul says here, it was given this grace to me, this gift to me, to preach, and then it says toll, and this word here is very, very unusual. <clears throat> it was a word that was, uh, that was invented in the Septuagint in Job 5 and 9 and 9 and 10. And in Romans 11 and 33, it means uh, ana ek and hypnos. It means to not be able to interpret. It 
When the white men came to this land over here, the Indians could slip around and go all around their villages and everything. And they could watch them, and they never knew the Indians were there. When the Indians left, they would even <coughs> rub out their tracks. So they'd never know they had even been there. That's what this word means, is to rub out tracks. That's what it literally means, is to rub out tracks. Untrackable. Can you say that word again? Uh, next, e ni ostone. It comes from Anna and Ek and Hiknos. Untrackable. Unoutable. <laughs> you can't figure it out, is what it means. You can't figure it out. When we have fought wars at different times in the world, they had what we call uh, <coughs> special forces. That could slip in and out, get in and out of places without being seen, uh, kind of camouflaged and everything. That's what the Indians were doing here all the time. When England came over here, they thought they could stand up in a line and shoot at the Indians, and the Indians just whooped the socks off of them. And the only reason why the Americans won war against uh, the uh, English was because they fought like Indians. They had to learn how to do that. And they could rub out their tracks wherever they go. They could not be tracked down. <coughs> they got a guy over there in the Middle East or someplace right now. They've been Osama bin Laden. They've been trying to find that rascal for a long time. He's rubbing out his tracks. He's untraceable, untrackable. <coughs> Unsearchable. That's how it's translated. Riches, two folks. Unsearchable riches of Christ. We can't really understand those riches, can we? The world is so much in our way that we can't even see... <coughs> we can't even see the true value of the glory of God. Many people might look at you if you're a faithful servant of God and say, why in the world do you go to church on Wednesday night after you've worked hard all day long? Go down there and sit down and hear <coughs> some preacher preach. I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, I'm not going to go to church and, and sit there and listen to somebody making eighty or or $100,000 a year that I can learn at home. I told him, come to my class. When I teach you, you can't learn at home. <laughs> I'll guarantee you. <laughs> I said, I'll guarantee you that. I challenge you to that one. The ministry is a very special place of God. I've said this before. If God has called you to preach, you ought to go and learn everything that you can learn about preaching. If you not, don't, you're not worthy of the calling of God. You ought to learn it. Tonight we're studying the Bible from the original languages. <clears throat> Is the King James Version inspired of God? I want to know. Is it? No? Why? You had about 50 people translating that, and it was translated for the Church of England with all of their doctrines intact. All right? How about New American Standard? Is that one inspired of God? No. It's probably the most accurate. It's, it's a lot more accurate. It's a lot more accurate. Is it the Word of God? Yeah, partially. Uh, is it the Word of God? I, I, partially. No. It's not the Word of God. It's translator's word, interpretation of the Word of God. Now, if you wanted to study the Word of God, what would you have to do? The Word of God. You would have to go to the original languages. You missed so much. Some, otherwise, you're reading somebody else's mail. Right tonight, you know what we're doing? We have a direct line to God's Word. <laughs> Minus no translator or anything. You've got it. We can sit here, we can discuss the Word of God, and we can see it. 
Absolutely. That's God's Word. This is God's Word. 3 and verse 9. No middleman. <laughs> You've got it in your hands. You've got the Word of God. Do you see how important it is to study the Word of God? The Word of God? Do you, if you were a preacher and you couldn't read the Word of God to find out what God really said, were you really doing the, are you really doing the congregation any justice? How long does it take to learn the Word of God? It took me 12 years in seminary. You know what? All I got was a license to learn at that time. I didn't really know much. All I got was a license to be able to pick up the Old Testament and the New Testament and be able to read God's unsearchable riches and try to communicate them to a congregation or to a people someplace. That's all I got. I can go and I can read Colin de Leach. I can read, read many commentaries in Latin and, and Hebrew and Greek. A lot of those things, you know, they, they comment on in Latin or German. you got to be able to read a little bit of those languages to understand even the word studies. Very important. Paul said, I'm, I was picked out and this grace was given to me to preach the unsearchable riches of God. We ought to be able to at least go back and find out some of the basics. Huh? Kai? Potise? Tis? Pei? Oikonomia? Tu? Misteriu? Two, two. Apo kek kru menu. Apo kek kru menu. Apo, ton, ayono, ayono, en, en, to, theo, to, ta, panta, katasanti. Katasanti. And. Paul says, to put in the light, to turn the light on. All preachers do, all teachers do, is to turn the light on so you can read the pages. Your study at home in God's Word, when you start to learn the Scriptures, is very important to your sanctification. What does the word sanctify mean? It really means to set apart, doesn't it? How are you to renew your minds every day? How is that supposed to take place? By the study of God's Word, by putting God's Word into your head and in your mind. <coughs> and to... Now remember, Paul was the trustee, the executor of this estate that God had given to him. His estate was to bring the Gentiles into churches and to indoctrinate them. What's the, what is the job of the church in the world today? It's not go ye therefore, is it? What is it? Make saints and disciples. Make disciples. Make disciples. Make habitual learners. Teach. Make habitual learners. This is called a discipleship class right here. This is a discipleship class. You don't have to take this class. You can go in our church. You can listen to a preacher preach or one of the young guys or whatever. You can listen to them preach over there. But if you really want to be a disciple, then you go into a discipleship class and you learn the Word of God more perfectly. And I think we have one of the greatest classes in the church because we're learning God's Word directly. When we play in Hebrew, we learn from Hebrew Old Testament. When we're in the New Testament, we learn what it says directly. Our uh, <clears throat> Ephesians 1.18. Somebody go to Ephesians 1.18 and read that to me. Ephesians 1.18. It's just a page over in most of your Bible. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful... Future he has promised to those he called. I want you to realize the rich and glorious inheritance he has given to his people. That's beautiful, isn't it? He said, "What he's going to? He's going to take the eyes of your heart and turn the light on so they can see." Who's he talking to? 
New Testament churches to build them up in the ways of the Lord so they can make disciples. And what are they going to do? These disciples? Be baptized, following the Lord, and then teach other disciples. And to put on the light, what the oikonomia, what's the oikonomia? It comes from oikos and nomia. Okay? What is this? Is the church today the administrator of God's kingdom? Are they the executors of God's kingdom in the world today? That's what it says right here. This is oikonomia. This is the house law. Okay? This is how God's mission in this world will be accomplished by his administrator of his kingdom. Who was the administrator of God's kingdom in Noah's day? No. Who was the God's the administrator of God's kingdom in Abraham's day? Abraham. They were examples. They led the world. Abraham led his people. Abraham taught his children that there was a promise to come, that God had made a promise to them, and he taught it so indelibly that they believed it for hundreds of years before it ever happened. Today, for almost 2,000 years, God's churches have been preaching the truth in season and out of season. How would you like to have been in one of them churches in about 1400 A.D.? Your family was. You know, this guy is a descendant of those churches right there. I don't want to make you proud. Right there. Mennonites. Anabaptists. They hid out in the mountains. Remind me to bring that book, The Valleys of the Piedmont, The Churches of the Valleys of Piedmont. You need to look at that. Tells the people's names that were killed and, and murdered and, and just absolutely tortured to death where they lived. They had lived in the mountains because they couldn't preach the word openly. Many times the Anabaptists were absolutely forbidden to make one convert. Did you know that? To even make one convert. They never fought in a war. They never harmed anybody out through history. These people were separate from the world. The writer said they, the world was not worthy of them. They preached the unsearchable riches of God. It was there. They were, they were the real legitimate administrators of God's kingdom all that time. The churches were Catholicism, the Church of England. You know who told on Catholicism when they killed all those Anabaptists in, in the valleys of the Piedmont, the Waldenses? The Church of England told on them. The whole thing about the Church of England, she'd done it too. She came right out of her mother. You know, the fruit doesn't far, fall far from the tree. <laughs> she acted just like her mother. How many of you remember Queen Mary? Mary, Queen of Scots? What kind of a person was she? What did she was she religiously tolerant to Baptist? She burned everybody at the stake that disagreed with Catholicism. Tried to bring her country back to Catholicism. All down through the ages, God has had his people that were the trustees, the managers, the management of God's word in the world. And what did they manage? What did they manage? To misterio. What's that? The mystery. Now who is the Word of God a mystery to? I talked about the church tonight because we're in the church chapter of the Bible. Who, who is the church a secret to? The unsaved. Well, it's a secret to the unsaved, but it's a secret to all of those outside of the New Testament church relationship. Brother David, did you understand what a real New Testament church was six months ago? No. <laughs> Do you understand a little more about it today? Yes. Because you've been exposed to it, haven't you? You have to be exposed to one of those before you know what it is. That teaching comes from them. It just doesn't come from the world. You could stay 50 years in a free will Baptist church and you're never going to hear it. <laughs> you're not going to have it. It's not going to happen. You could stay in Catholicism for 100 years and you will not hear it. Well, they got some kind of an idea that they are the church. 
but they gave it up a long time ago, about 1,800 years ago. The stewardship of the mystery, of the, this mystery, of the, having been hidden, perfect participle passive, genus singular neuter, this mystery has been hidden. Who's it been hidden from? All the other ages, all the way back to Adam. Adam did not know the secret that God would bring the, all the people in the world together in one administration. Everybody, black, white, yellow, red, purple, could have part in the service in the New Testament church someday. But to the world, it's a secret still. Hidden from, from the world for ages. Ages. Angels sought to understand the mystery of Christ in His church. It's really a mystery to the world. And then it says, in the God, in the things all, having created. And all of God's creation, and all of God's creation, this mystery is a mystery to many. It's a mystery. It is a mystery to the uninitiated. You know we have secret societies in the world, don't we? What are some of the secret societies in the world? Masons. Masons. What else? Skull and bones. Skull and bones. <coughs> what else? Knights of Columbus. All right, that's the Catholic Church's secret religion, secret society. We see uh, uh, the, Mace, uh, the Mormon Church, basically, is a secret society. It's absolutely copied right out of, out of the, the Masonic Lodge. Old Joseph Smith was a Mason one time, and he decided to make him a religion based upon all of the little ceremonies and things that they did. And if you are familiar with the Mormon Church, they very much studied it very much, and the, the Masonic Lodge, you're going to see a whole lot of similarities. He took that and, and made it a religion, a secret society. You know, Satan has never created anything. And God has created all things. But Satan did do something. He was the father of lies. He's the father of rebellion. He's the father of sin. He's the originator of sin. Every time God has ever done anything, Satan has imitated it. Remember when... Now, this is a close correlation here. Symbol of some symbolism. Remember when Moses went into Egypt? He took his prophet with him, didn't he? Who was his prophet? I took his brother Aaron. He took his brother Aaron. That was the prophet. Moses was like a god, and, and, and Aaron was the prophet. Well, <clears throat> Aaron would speak, and he would perform these miracles. And Moses would tell him what to do. When he went down there, the first thing he went there before Pharaoh, the first miracle, what, what was the first miracle that he performed? Do you remember? When he turned, what? Water out of the rock? No. That was all. Did, did the uh, grasshoppers or uh, well, that wasn't the frogs or yeah. the, the staff? No, oh, when he turned the staff, Aaron's staff, into a serpent. What did the the magicians of Pharaoh do? They threw their staff down and they became serpents. But God's serpents swallowed all of them up. Every time that they did something, even when they turned the river into blood, what did they do? They imitated. Okay? When God found his New Testament churches, what did Satan immediately do? He imitated it. He brought in false doctrine. And it wasn't in the world then, right? In Paul's day? Yes, it was. In John's, the book of Jude says, Earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Earnestly contend for... Do you have a question, Brother Bill? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's 
Well, no, but not, before Pharaoh. Oh, before that was that was later. Yeah. That was he was the leader of Israel in, in, the, in the wilderness. That was the only miracle he performed when he hit the rock. Well, he did. Water. Didn't Moses do that himself? Moses parted the Red Sea, mm -hmm. but Aaron yeah. did all the miracles in Egypt when he left, and he took over. Yeah. Okay, that was a different episode, a different oh, okay. time, a different age. Okay, so to speak. All right. Wasn't it mainly because Moses refused to do it? He Before refused God. to do it, and he said, okay, shut your mouth, Moses. You tell Aaron what to do, and Aaron will be my prophet, and you will be a god to Aaron. And they will look at you as if you are God. Okay? You are my representative, and he's yours. All right. Having been hidden from the ages in God, all things having been created. In 3 and verse 10. Now, this mystery was made known to Paul. Hina. Hina. No reste, no reste, need, need, toss, toss, our case, our case, kai, kai, taste, taste, exousias, exousias, toys, toys, uporanos, uporanos, dia, dia, taste, ecclesias, ecclesias, hey, plu, polu, poi, kilos. That's a hard word. Polu, poi, kilos. Sophia. To the you. My wife likes that name Sophia so much. I think she'd like to be called Sophia. <laughs> you like that name? All right. That's beautiful. In order that it might be made known. All right. Third person singular first error. Subjunctive passive. All right. It might be caused to be made known. This is what we call the futuristic. Subjunctive, by the way, if you want to write that down someplace, if, if it's not written down, this is what you call a futuristic subjunctive, and it's passive because it might be caused to be made known now. Look at that word, neen. That means now. To the rulers. To all of the world. How are all the nations going to be judged? The sheep and the goat nations? How are they going to be judged? On two premises. The, the nations in the world that are going to go into the millennial reign, how are they going to be judged? How they have treated God's churches and how they have treated God's nation. Israel. That it might be caused to be named known now to the rulers and to the authorities in the Uranois, what is that? Heavens. But what is the epi Uranois? Above heavens. In the heavens. Now, every nation on the earth has spiritual forces behind it. Did you know that? Every nation on earth has spiritual forces behind it. Now, when God makes known His, His riches, His glories, His truths, His gospel to the world through his churches, all right, it not only happens here, but you know who's listening to us tonight? Angels. Did you know that? Angels are listening. That's what it says here. Angels. Listen to what's going on in this world. Angels are behind nations. Angels are behind people. Angels are behind politics. Politicians. I don't know how many good angels are behind them. <laughs> I don't know about that. Rulers and to the authorities. And in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we're going to see this repeated again. In the sixth chapter, that is. We're going to see who these rascals are. They're world grabbers. What's a world grabber? Hmm? A worldly person? Well, what, what is a... Uh, what have they taught she of children in school for the last 20 years, by the way? Evolution. Well, evolution, yeah. yeah. But what have they taught them in school? Get out and succeed at any cost. Don't what have been teaching in the movies? 
What all these uh, stock market movies about? Cutting somebody's throat to get ahead. Cutting slices, slitting gold. A till of the hun society. That's what we are. A till of the hun society. Cut and slash and get ahead. To the authorities in the heavenlies. And then dia. What does dia mean? By the agency of. It means through, literally. But in here and many other places, it means by the agency of. You can look that up on page 90 if you want to. If you want to write that down. Of the, by the agency of the tes ecclesios. Who is the ecclesios? How is the world going to be taught? How do the angels learn? Through the, church. Through the church. Who's the administrator in God's kingdom? The churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a job to do today. We have a job. We have a heavenly mission. It doesn't matter when we reach out in the world. It doesn't matter when we reach out in the world. But you know the place that we better reach out most of all and the best of all? Right in the congregation. Right in the church. I've told this so many times. There aren't any perfect churches. There aren't any perfect churches. But that's God's way of administrating His kingdom in the world today. So we have to respect His choices. We have to respect His choice. I haven't found a perfect church in the world today. I haven't found one. But I've been teaching here in this church almost 10 years and they haven't hurt me too much. <laughs> and you know what? I think that I have glorified God in the preaching of His Word. I believe that. And I believe that for hundreds of years and thousands of years and millennia to come that He's going to glorify God. A little bit what I taught. Because some of them people are going to go into eternity. And they got a little bit of primer here of how to glorify God and how to serve God. And they've taught it to others. It really, my, I've spent a lot of time studying God's Word. A lot of years. Spent a lot of my time. My wife gets mad at me sometimes. But I go to a restaurant with her and I take a book that I'm studying. Well, it's the truth. My mother looked at me and she said, you got manners you haven't used yet. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm interested. I took it serious about teaching God's Word. Well, I let you guys talk all you want. I'll say a word or two now and then. <laughs> and I'll pray when we get ready to eat and things like that. Well, but you I know what? You what you're reading. Yeah, you ask me what I'm reading. I carried something in the other day. I, I forgot my book and left it in the car the other day. And she said, "Well, am I, am, am I first place today?" I was thinking a lot. You know what? I don't have to have a book in my hand always. I'm thinking. I go out feeding the pigs and the horse and everything like that, and I'm thinking. You know, one of the best places in the world for people to think was behind the plow. Just go back and forth doing the same thing. You didn't have to think much about it, about that. You could think about God's Word. A lot of those old farmers memorized the Bible. They thought a lot about it. It's good for you to think. It's a good trick if you can do it. Learn to think. All right. It might be made known now to the rulers and to the authorities, even in the heavens, by the agency of the church, the polypoikilos, the many-sided, manifold, many-shaded, much diversified, many-tinted. How many of you ever looked at a, a rainbow intensely? Huh? Yeah. What do you see, Marilyn? When you look at rainbow? Colors. Lots of colors. If you look, you'll see all kinds. You'll see some basic colors, and in between those colors, what are you seeing? Five differences. Shades. Thousands of shades of those colors. That's what this is talking about right here. The many-shaded wisdom of the God. 
God had a reason why he's done what he's done. All we have to do is just be satisfied with that and just let God do what he wants to do and let God do what he wants to do through us. Let God do what he wants to do. Bring his riches, his many colored wisdom, variegated wisdom to the world. You know, when you're a machinist, when you're a welder, you learn different things, different techniques to do different things. You learn when you're building things, you learn metal. You learn different about, about different metal. How many of you know what a fluted barrel is? A long time ago, on the inside of a barrel, now there are grooves that make a, a rifle bullet spin or a pistol bullet spin. It makes it more accurate. You have to have that barrel straight, and, and it had the grooves have to be right to make it spin right. They have to be the right twist to it. All this is very important. And <clears throat> my wife's grandfather was a watchmaker, and he was a gunmaker. And I know a little bit about guns, because I'm a gunsmith too, a little bit. What you call a shade tree, shade tree gunsmith. And my wife, we were up in Carson City, Nevada, and I got to see one of her grandfather's guns that he had built. This gun was built like in 1870. It was a match rifle. It was a target rifle. I looked at that thing. It had double set triggers. That's where you pull one trigger hard and then you just touch the other one when you get it on target. <coughs> yeah, the breech was made in such a way it was very modern. It had... Uh, double adjustable sights on the front and on the back both for elevation, windage, and everything else. And of course when you f fire a, a gun several times, a rifle several times, it what happens to it? The barrel whips around and doesn't land in the same place as the stock. Yeah. Well, the stock was embedded in a certain way. It was floated. The barrel was fluted. It would cool better. You know when you have fins on things and and uh, uh, different, even in your car, it's got your radiator has fins on it to cool it. The engine, the coolant goes through it, and the fins cool it. It it transfers heat. It cools it. I'm that sorry. old that old barrel was a fluted barrel. I looked looked at all these things, all all kinds of stuff. You know what? To only to a gunmaker or a machinist would that mean anything? As we study God's word. I hope it means more to you when you know more about it. These things are very important. This word Sophia is the ability to bring about glory. It's the wisdom to bring about glory under any circumstances to the nth degree. It is the ability to bring about glory to God. That's what we call godly wisdom. All right? As you study God's Word, this wisdom... This Sophia, the many folded, the many sided, the many colored, the many tinted wisdom God. Well, thank you very much for your attention tonight. I hope you'll learn something from God's Word. Our next, every verse in the book of Ephesians is fantastic. But the next one talks about the purpose, God's eternal purpose in Christ Jesus. God's eternal purpose and His unpreventable progress. You know, everything that's going on in the world today isn't God's will. Everything that America does, everything that any nation in the world do, it is not God's direct will, but it is God's permissive will. He has allowed the rulers to rise and to come up in the world today to bring about the end times that we're coming to. This is what we call the apex, the, uh, the climax of the ages of the world. It's about to come to an end. We're right there, close to the end time. I don't know how close it is. It may last another 20 years. I don't know. But we're close to the end of it. I never thought that I would see the things happen in the world that I'm seeing happen today. Never thought.
I thought the Lord would come back before this happens. But as I see it, I just see, so see the fulfillment of God's Word more every day. It's been revealed God, in God's Word. So many things that, that uh, preachers and teachers have tried to teach in, in, down through the world, down through the ages, down through times. In the 1600s, they did not know what we know today because of prophecy that has been fulfilled. Prophecy that has been fulfilled. After Israel became a nation, I don't know how anybody ever was a preterist again. Or a historicist. <laughs> it's the second time, Brother Mike. I was taking a class from Pastor Phil on, uh, it was an evolution class with Chuck Colson's. Yeah. And uh, he was saying how if we all get together, we can change the world. And uh, But really, this is God's will. It's God's will. Everything's going to get worse. And yes. you can help in some circumstances, but you can't change the world and make it. Uh, righteous. No. Because you we can't know do. All you can do is protect your present family as much as you possibly can. That's what your job is. And your church, as a church, you're supposed to educate your young people. That's all you can do. Our job as a church is here first. How many churches are not educating their people? I've got a tape that I'm going to play on evolution in my Sunday school class when we get into the Bible in eight ages when we get to that place. I got it and I've listened to it, watched it a couple of times already. It's I think it will be a lot it would be a lot of ammunition and a lot of good for our young people and for the parents to help teach them because they're being taught evolution in school. I, I mean it's a sh it's a shame that they have. And this is uh, it questions evolution is what it does. It just questions it legitimately, scientifically. And I, I'm going to uh, do that in my, play it in my class, and I want you to get everybody in there that you can get before we do it. I hope we fill the classroom plumb up, because people need to know about this. What we teach tonight is very, very important. God's Word, God's truth, His administrator of His kingdom in the world today through His churches. But we need to act like churches. Ought to act. <laughs> Amen. Well, brother, sisters, thank you for paying attention tonight, uh, enduring those hard seats. Brother David, I'm glad that you're here tonight. I'm glad I can see that you're a little uncomfortable. Your stomach's still hurting you. He had to go through a terrible ordeal and persecution yesterday. Brother, would you dismiss him? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come to hear your word. Lord, we just thank you that... Uh, that you can write it on our hearts and impart it into our minds, Lord. Just help us to go out into the world and to make it known to others who do not know you, Lord. We just thank you for Brother Jim and the work that he does for your glory. We ask that you would be with him tomorrow in his test, that the doctor would have steady hands and that he would have a favorable report. Lord, we just uh, thank you for his family, and we thank you for all the people that are here this evening. And we bless him. Amen. Amen. Amen.